Welcome to another Hopeless Production. My name is Josh, and this is episode one of the Mystery Series. Let's get into it. On February 1st, 1959, nine Russian hikers mysteriously died in the Ural Mountains of Siberia in an event now known as the Dyatlov Pass Incident. Igor Dyatlov, a 23-year-old radio engineering student at the Ural Polytechnic Institute, assembled a group of university peers to go on an expedition to be granted Category 3 hikers, which was the highest skill level at the time. All were Category 2, and in order to go up a level, they must complete a Category 3 hike. They arrived in the town of Ivdel on January 25th and took a trek to the most northern village they could. On January 27th, they began the trek. Just a day later, one of the hikers, Yuri Yudin, began suffering from knee and other joint pains, making him unable to continue. Before leaving, Dyatlov had agreed he would send a telegram to their sports club team as soon as the group returned to the starting point. It was anticipated that this would happen no later than February 12th, but Dyatlov had told Yudin that he expected it to be longer. Yudin then returned back towards the village, being the last known person to see the group alive. On January 31st, the group arrived at the edge of the highland area and began to prepare for the upcoming inclines. The following day, the hikers started to move through the pass, previously named Dead Mountain, before the incident. It seems they planned to get over the pass and make camp for the next night on the opposite side, but because of worsening weather conditions, the decreased visibility caused them to lose their way, deviating west. Upon realizing their mistake, the group decided to stop and set up camp on the slope of the mountain, rather than move a mile downhill to the forested area that would have offered some shelter from the bad weather. Yudin, who had headed back to the village just days before, later said the outlaw probably did not want to lose the altitude he had gained, or he decided to practice camping on the mountain slope. At this point, it is unknown what happens to the group after setting up their camp. On February 20th, the relatives of the travelers demanded a rescue operation, and the head of the institute the group attended sent the first rescue groups, consisting of volunteer students and teachers. Before long, the Russian army and police force would join in, adding help from the air to the effort. On February 26th, the searchers found the group's abandoned and badly damaged tent. The campsite baffled the search party. The student who found the tent said it was half torn down and covered with snow. It was empty and all the group's belongings and shoes had been left behind. Investigators said the tent had been cut open from the inside. Eight or nine sets of footprints left by people who were wearing only socks or a single shoe or were even barefoot could be followed leading down towards the edge of the nearby woods on the opposite side of the pass, about a mile to the northeast. At the forest edge, under a large Siberian pine, the searchers found the remains of a small fire along with two bodies, shoeless and dressed only in their underwear. The branches on the pine tree were broken up to five meters high, suggesting that one of the skiers had climbed up to look for something, perhaps the camp. Between the pine and the camp, the searchers found three more corpses, including Dyatlov, who seemed to have died in poses, suggesting that they were attempting to return to the tent. They were found separately at distances of 300, 480, and 630 meters from the tree. Finding the remaining four travelers took more than two months. They were finally found on May 4th under 13 feet of snow in a ravine 250 feet further into the woods from the pine tree. Three of those four were better dressed than the others, and there were signs that those who had died first had their clothing salvaged by others. Some of the clothing had burn damage. A medical examination found no injuries that might have led to their deaths, and it was eventually concluded that they had all died of hypothermia. One had a small crack in his skull, but it was not thought to be a fatal wound. A further examination of the four bodies that were found in May shifted the narrative as to what had occurred during the incident. Three of the ski hikers had fatal injuries, one had major skull damage, and two had major chest fractures. Experts said the force required to cause such damage would have been extremely high, comparable to the force of a car crash. Notably, the bodies had no external wounds associated with the bone fractures, as if they had been subjected to high level of pressure. All four bodies found at the bottom of the creek in a running stream of water had soft tissue damage to their head and face. For example, one was missing her tongue, eyes, part of the lips, as well as facial tissue and a fragment of skull bone while one had his eyeballs missing and another his eyebrows. There was initial speculation that the indigenous Mansi people, who were local reindeer herders, had attacked and murdered the group for trespassing upon their lands. Several Mansi were interrogated, but the investigation indicated that the nature of the deaths did not support this hypothesis. Only the hikers' footprints were visible and they showed no sign of hand-to-hand -hand struggle. 
Another group of hikers, 31 miles south of the incident, reported that they saw strange orange spheres in the sky to the north on the night of the incident. Similar spheres were observed in Ivdel and adjacent areas continuously during the period from February to March 1959 by various independent witnesses, including the Meteorology Service and the military. However, these sightings were not noted in the initial investigation in 1959, and these various independent witnesses only came forward years later. So to review, these are the things that we know. Six of the group members died of hypothermia and three of fatal injuries. There were no indications of other people nearby apart from the nine travelers. The tent had been ripped open from inside. The victims had died six to eight hours after their last meal. High levels of radiation were found on only one victim's clothing. The fatal injuries of the three bodies could not have been caused by another human being because the force of the blows had been too strong and no soft tissue had been damaged in relation to the known injuries. Release documents contain no information about the condition of the skier's internal organs. There were no survivors of the incident. In February 2019, Russian authorities reopened the investigation into the incident, although only three possible explanations were being considered. An avalanche, a snow slab avalanche, or a hurricane. The possibility of a crime has been discounted. Here are a few of the active theories with some being public speculation and some are government speculation. There's the avalanche theory which has a few issues. There were no signs of an avalanche taking place in the search area. There weren't any patterns in the snow that an avalanche would leave behind and the tree line would have been damaged. On top of the area not having the necessary conditions to create an avalanche, it is widely believed that the hikers were too experienced to have made the mistake of setting up in an area with a high risk of there being an avalanche. The footprints of the hikers appeared to show them walking, not running away in a panic. With this information, it's likely that this wasn't the result of an avalanche. Then there's the catabatic wind theory, which doesn't have much evidence, but it's not exactly being ruled out either. A catabatic wind is a downslope wind that can get up to hurricane speeds with the geography of the area. It would have been made possible for this to occur. But some evidence in this case doesn't really line up. For instance, the pressure the body seemed to endure would not have been explained by wind. There's also the infrasound theory. Infrasound is a low frequency sound that causes physical discomfort and mental distress and could have taken place in Dyatlov Pass because of the acoustics between the mountains and wind. It's not impossible, but not likely that this caused them to leave the tent. Some of the public looks toward military testing as the cause, using parachute bombing to explain the orange orbs in the sky. This type of testing was used in the area at the time, but several of the wounds did not add up with the effects of the bombing. One of the more popular theories is paradoxical undressing. It's caused by hypothermia where subjects remove their clothes in response to perceived feelings of burning warmth. It is undisputed that six of the nine hikers died of hypothermia. However, others in the group appear to have acquired additional clothing from those who had already died, which suggests that they were of sound enough mind to try to add layers. There's a few more theories that go into this, but I think most of them are pretty funny. Some theorize that high winds blew one member away, causing the others to attempt to rescue the person. This one is just stupid in a few different ways, but the bottom line is that a large experienced group would not have behaved like this, and winds strong enough to blow away people would have also blown away the tent. Some also suggested that they were hunted and killed by the Mansi people, but the local tribesmen were known to be peaceful and there was no track evidence of anyone approaching the tent. Another one is that wild animals chased the group, but there were no animal tracks and the group would not have abandoned the relative security of the tent. Some local newspapers suggested an argument, possibly related to a romantic encounter that left some of them only partially clothed, leading to a violent dispute. Yuri over here don't like that uh, Vladimir's messing with this girl, so he hit him so hard that he ended up naked in the woods. Someone who knew the group members later said that it is highly implausible. By all indications, the group was largely harmonious and sexual tension was confined to flirtation and crushes. There were no drugs present and the only alcohol was a small flask of medicinal alcohol found intact at the scene. The group had even sworn off cigarettes for the expedition. And the final theory, alien. Overall, I don't think there's one theory that encompasses all the evidence presented. The truth is that we'll probably never know the answer. Between Russia's tight grip on what gets to the public and the amount of time that has passed, any new information is going to be hard to come by. Thanks for watching this week's Hopeless Production. Even though it's more of a listening experience now, you know, we can't, we can't edit videos, it's, it, it'll get there, don't worry.